to be exposed to the elements, exposed to the dangers, it does prepare you for your life generally. I've been well blessed. I've been born into a family which were, from the fishing point of view, were progressive. Because my father had double hernia and sugar diabetes, they allowed my father to stay home from the war. The grounds out there were very lucrative because nobody had been fishing them. But he was able to go to sea and do his fishing, provided when he came ashore at night, he was custodian of Paynton Harbour. So my father was able to consolidate his small business. My father was always prepared to listen. He would get in his car on a Saturday afternoon and he would go down to Hope Cove and he'd sit there and talk to the fishermen. He would get out of the big car with his trilby hat on and they would think, who's this bloke? He would soak up information and then bring it back and implement it. He was a pioneer. He developed the wire pots, he developed the line of pots so that you could haul with the mechanism of the capstan. He progressed. He had 34 boats built in his life. I can't say that everything is to be attributed to him. Uh, Wilfred Hubbard and Eric Hubbard, who's still down in Brixton now, engineers, they would sit and talk to my father. And my father would explain what he wanted done. So it was a joint effort. Hinks of Appledore built a number of boats for us. My father knew exactly what he wanted. And so Alan Hinks conformed to every single thing that my father, because my father knew intricately where things had to go when you were at sea. And my father was able to have a wooden capstan fitted, which was driven off the main engine. Now, all this was progressive thinking to develop how to haul more than one pot at a time. We were able to perfect it so much that we could haul 50 pots in under 30 minutes. You'd have four men, one would work the capstan, one would be on a set of rollers, lifting the pot in over the side of the boat, another would be emptying the contents, and another one would be baiting the pots and stacking them on the port side. And every half an hour, we were then ready to relay those pots. And we were always looking for new areas we found that the offshore grounds were as lucrative, probably more lucrative, because they'd never been fished. Every so often you'd come across an area which was extremely lucrative, about 30 miles out into the English Channel. Right up through the centre was a ridge of rocks, and it was never ever fished. And we were able to go right up through there and we would come in with these baskets of lobsters. Some of them were huge. Some of them were weighing four or five pounds in weight, you know, big lobsters. They'd been there since time began almost, you know. So it was very, very exciting times. My father was extremely ambitious. He had been selling his crab to a factory in Chichester and lorry loads of our crabs have been going up there and my father thought to himself do you know we could do that and he he had a factory built down at the harbour and then he started to get these women <laughs> he built up a nucleus of ladies 45 we had in the in the factory picking out crab meat and selling it. We were catching 
so many English edible crabs that the live market would have been at saturation point. But to take it and turn it into pound packs of crab meat, if it was deep frozen, it could last for six months, 12 months. And also, you could go down to the factory if you wanted to, which people did who were running cockle stores or sea fish stores, and buy it fresh as it was being picked. So we built up a very, very good business with the crab meat processing. We had a wonderful clientele. Never had any trouble selling it. 